Pre-Money Valuation, How to Calculate It. My name is Carl Shergren. I'm a blogger and author of a forthcoming book called The Fair Share Model. The Fair Share Model is about a performance-based capital structure to raise venture capital via a public offering. I'll tell you more about it later. What is the valuation of a company? Well, it's the price to buy the entire company, as in Microsoft will buy LinkedIn for $26 billion. In that case, Microsoft values LinkedIn at $26 billion. It seems obvious that if 100% of a company is available for a price, say $1 million, that the valuation of the company is $1 million. Valuation is not so obvious when a fractional amount, less than 100%, is available for sale. Investors have to calculate valuation differently than an acquirer. For example, to an investor, the valuation of a company is $1 million if 50% is offered for $1 million, 66 is offered for $2 million, or 33% is offered for a half million dollars. I will show you how to make sense of this and how to calculate valuation from an investor's perspective. Value versus worth. Valuation is a slippery word. Its meaning is context sensitive. A company's valuation is its price, not necessarily its worth. A company's market value reflects the most recent price for a piece or a share of it. If someone says a company is overvalued, they mean it is overpriced. If they say a company is undervalued, they mean it is underpriced or a bargain. Valuation experts use valuation to mean what they think a company may be worth, considering evidence of both worth in terms of asset value and income generating capability and market value. But markets can overvalue and undervalue a company. As a result, there is often a difference between value or the valuation and what something is worth. So what is worth? We sense worth for what we derive utility from. Home, clothing, food. We sense, for example, if a house is worth $1 million, a pair of pants is worth $60, or if a sandwich is worth $5. But we struggle to sense worth in investments such as art or security. That's because they lack utility. Nonetheless, Valuation is important if you want an attractive return on an investment. The determinants of a return on investment are the price paid, or the buy-in valuation, the price received, or the exit valuation, and the length of time an investment is held. Our focus is the price paid, or buy-in valuation. Another reason why valuation is a slippery term is that there is a pre-money valuation and a post-money valuation. And which one is important? depends on the context, as the next slide will show. So which valuation is important when? We're going to compare pre-money valuation and post-money valuation for a private company and a public company. For a private company, pre-money valuation is always important. For a private company, post-money valuation is interesting, but it's unimportant. There's no secondary market. What is important is the pre-money valuation of the next round of capital. For a public company, pre-money valuation is important for an IPO. It's the initial price setting in the public market. It's a moot point for a secondary offering because it's generally set at the trading price. For a public company, post-money valuation is important. It's the market capitalization. Pre-money valuation simplified. Imagine you are checking out a pair of pants offered for sale for $20. You put $20 in the pocket. What is the value of the pants? Well, clearly it depends on when, before or after you put $20 in the pocket. If the pants were worth $20, they were fairly priced before your $20, they are now worth $40. But if they were worth $30 to begin with, in other words, they were underpriced at 20. The pants are now worth $50. On the other hand, if the pants were only worth $15, they were overpriced at $20. They are now worth $35. Why is pre-money the key figure? Pre-money is the price before the offering, the new money. Let's look at our pants example again and consider the equivalent for a company. 
the pre-money valuation is equivalent to the price of the pants. The offering is equivalent to the money that you put in the pants pocket. And the post-money valuation is equivalent to the value of the pants with your money. So clearly, the relevant question is whether the asset, be it pants or a company, is worth the price before the offering, before the new money is added. There are two ways to calculate valuation, the shares outstanding method and the percentage of ownership method. The shares outstanding method requires the number of shares outstanding before the offering, the number of new shares offered, and the price of a new share. The percentage of ownership method requires the total amount of money to be raised in the offering and the percentage of the company to be sold in the offering. What is known determines the method to use. We'll first look at the share method calculation. Here's the formula. Pre-money valuation equals the number of shares outstanding before the investment times the price of a new share. Let's apply this in an example. ABC Company has 10 million shares outstanding and plans to raise $5 million. It offers 1 million new shares at $5 per share. So its pre-money valuation is $50 million. And here's how we calculate it. Here's the relationship between the pre and post money valuation. $50 million is the pre-money valuation. $5 million is the money raised. And $55 million is the post money valuation. The percentage method calculation takes a few steps and we'll follow it in a new example. Let's say another company, XYZ, seeks to raise $10 million in exchange for 10% of the company. What is the pre-money valuation of XYZ company? The relationship between money and valuation can be expressed as either pre-money valuation plus the money equals post-money valuation, which is the presentation we just saw. It could be also expressed as post-money valuation minus the money equals the pre-money valuation. It could also be pre-money valuation equals post-money valuation minus the money. Pre-money valuation is in bold as a reminder that it's the figure we're interested in. The next slide references this. The formula to calculate pre-money valuation using the percentage method is this. It looks a bit ungainly, but when you recognize that the post-money valuation equals the investment amount divided by the percentage of the company for sale, and that the money equals the investment amount, the formula boils down to this. Pre-money valuation equals post-money valuation minus the money. So let's apply the percentage formula. We're going to figure out XYZ's pre-money valuation if $10 million buys 10% of the company. We'll divide the $10 million investment by 10% to get the post-money valuation of $100 million. Subtract from that the amount of money to be raised, $10 million, and we have XYZ's pre-money valuation of $90 million. In a table presentation, we can see the pre-money valuation of $90 million plus the money, the $10 million, to get a post-money valuation of $100 million. Here we can follow where the post-money came from. We can see where the money came from and the pre-money valuation. The ownership split amounts to a proof because the question is, what is the pre-money valuation if $10 million buys 10% of the company? The percentage calculation is not intuitive. Unless you are a math whiz, you'll need a calculator to compute valuation using the percentage method. If you think you can eyeball it, be careful. Here's a table that will illustrate why. On the top row is the percentage of the company being sold. It starts off at 1%, goes to 10, 20, and all the way to 100%. The next row shows the pre-money valuation, which we're going to focus on, and the money investment, which is $10 million in every scenario. The post-money valuation we're going to ignore because it's interesting, but it's not important. Let's focus on the first colored column where 10% of a company is available for $10 million. Its pre-money valuation is $90 million. We just calculated that. Now we're going to compare that to the column next to it, where 20% of the company is available for $10 million. Note that while the percentage of the company doubled, the movement in the pre-money valuation is in the other direction, inverse, which you'd expect, but it's disproportionate to the change 
in the percentage of the company. This becomes clearer if we use larger changes. For example, let's double from 20% to 40% the amount of the company that $10 million buys. Note the pre-money valuation change. It is disproportionate. Where the percentage of a company doubles from 20 to 40, the pre-money valuation drops disproportionately from 40 million to 15 million. Let's do it again. Where $10 million buys 40% of the company, the pre-money valuation is 15 million. If you double that, so $10 million buys 80% of the company, the pre-money valuation falls to 3 million. Another way to make the point that the percentage method is non-intuitive is to show you that it's nonlinear. This is a chart that shows on the vertical axis the pre-money valuation and on the horizontal axis the percentage of a company purchased. For example, if $10 million buys 100% of a company, its pre-money valuation is zero. If $10 million buys 50% of the company, the pre-money valuation is $10 million. If $10 million buys 1% of the company, its pre-money valuation is $990 million. What this shows you is that the valuation changes in a non-linear manner as the percentage of the company purchased changes. There is a handy rule, however. If half the company is for sale, the pre-money valuation is always the amount of the offering. Other amounts are not intuitive. The right to acquire stock in the future at a lower price than new investors can cloud the significance of a pre-money valuation. Examples are restricted stock, stock options and warrants, convertible debt, multi-class capital structure, because such a structure enables special terms. Special terms granted to some investors can make a pre-money valuation somewhat meaningless for other investors. In other words, terms can eclipse a valuation. For example, special terms can involve price protection, such as a price ratchet, which provides a retroactive price reduction if later investors get a lower valuation. Another is a preferential return such as a liquidation preference. A liquidation preference enables an investor to get a multiple, it could be two times, five times, ten times, of an investment back before others get anything at all. Or it could be a redemption right, which obligates a company to buy back shares in the future. Venture capitalists rely more on getting the right terms than on getting the pre-money valuation right because it's so hard to reliably figure out what a company is worth. A company must have a multi-class capital structure to grant special terms. In a single class structure, investors are all for one and one for all. In a multi-class structure, all investors are shareholders, but some shareholders are more equal than others. Multi-class capital structures are common in private companies that have venture capital or private equity investors. They're far less common in public companies. Want more food for thought? Check out the Fair Share Model, the book I'm writing. It's about a performance-based capital structure for companies that raise venture capital via a public offering. I call it the Fair Share Model because it balances and aligns the interest of investors and employees. My target audience is anyone who might want to invest in or work for a venture stage company, or who has an interest in economics, philosophy, or organizational structures. The first section is an overview, describes the model, and answers some basic questions about it. The second section describes a macroeconomic context for the model. The third section discusses valuation. And the fourth section describes objections that people may have to having average investors participate in venture capital. There are other chapters to be written. It has tables to look up a pre-money valuation based on the percentage of the company sold. I want to show you what the pre-money valuation table bonus looks like. It's useful to answer the question, if a company offers X percent of its equity for an investment of Y dollars, what is the pre-money valuation? Here's how it works. You find the column with the offering size, find a row with the percentage of ownership offered, and the intersection is the pre-money valuation. The benefits of the table are that you can see the pre-money valuation without a calculation. It makes what-if scenarios easier and provides a better perspective 
on valuation. Your support helped to promote a movement to reimagine capitalism so that it works better for average investors. The use of a performance-based capital structure is not new. They're used in private offerings all the time. But their use in an IPO, an initial public offering, is revolutionary. Thanks for watching.